So Easter's resurrection grace has been chasing us, shaping our Sunday mornings. We have followed the way of grace into Jesus' encounter with Mary outside the tomb where he called her name. We have followed the way of grace into Jesus' encounter with Thomas in the locked room where he invited him to touch his wounds. We have traced the ways of grace in the life of Peter and in the other disciples. We have traced the way of grace in creation and in our salvation. And this morning, we've already traced some of the ways of grace in these families' lives as they dedicated their children. Where have you come face to face with grace in these weeks since, since Resurrection Sunday? Or maybe I should ask the question before that question. Have you? Have you come face to face with grace? Or are you tracking it, coming too late to an encounter and finding only the tracks in the sand, a word or a definition, evidence without a person, We have traced grace after loss. We have traced and tracked grace after doubt. We have tracked grace after betrayal in the scripture stories. Where have you found it? My prayer this week is that we would come face to face with grace. That we'd catch up to it. Or maybe that grace would catch up with us because you know that when you are seeking God, when you are seeking the grace of God found in Jesus, God's Son, through the Spirit of the living God, when we are seeking, we know that first of all, we have been sought. So has grace found you yet? This morning, we're going to trace the way of grace in our weaknesses. Because we know that this is most certainly where grace lives. This is the place where we often turn away and we avoid it, at least I do, the weaknesses in our own dark nights, the things that keep you awake and keep replaying on the video screen in your brain. We like to pay attention to our strengths, and we're told that we should live out of our strengths and work out of that. We should learn about our strengths. There's all kinds of tests that can help you and understand them, and that we, each one of us, are enough. I am enough we are told. But friends, I think that this is where grace, where God's grace certainly lives, where our strength runs out, where it peters out. Did you catch that? Sorry, I just had to say it out loud. Where it peters out. Sorry. Where our muscles fail, where our strategy takes us to the wrong outcome, where failure actually gives us the finger and taunts us, we find these words in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. It's a letter from the Apostle Paul to a church in Corinth, and it says, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. How do you feel about those words? What do they do to you? Do you sag with relief because you had forgotten about this grace? You've been doing things on your own. Or like, does your anxiety start to rise as you hear them, thinking about the rent that is coming due, that no grace is going to pay, hasn't yet, you don't really think that it will? Does your anger rise, thinking about the events of the past month, when you saw that grace did not rescue someone who needed rescue? Does your head tilt a little bit with curiosity, wondering what kind of grace could invert this algorithm of weakness and power? Do you feel like laughing at the ridiculousness of this claim, and you know that the Apostle Paul did not have to wake up in the middle of all the nights to feed an inconsolable infant who needed you every moment of every day? Paul's day was not driven by the constant pinging of a device that had access to him every moment of the day and a world wide web. Grace might have been enough for Paul, but not, you might be thinking, for you. Where do these words find you? Where does grace 
find you. Thinking about this scripture in the past weeks has felt a little like coming back to a familiar landmark after traveling to faraway places. Because this is one of the verses that I memorized as a kid. And I have the NIV, or no, I have the New Living uh, Translation up there. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. But I'm going to tell you, the one that I memorized is the one that trumps this. Without saying my grace is sufficient for you, my strength is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness, Paul says. It's a good one to memorize. These are words that sank deep into my bones. There have been seasons in my life when I spent a lot of time in 2 Corinthians, and I haven't sat there for a while. Sometimes these words have come like a whisper in a dark place, a promise I could hardly dare to believe. Sometimes I've looked back at a road I've traveled, and I I really only see grace through that rearview mirror coming back to these words with the events in the world as we see them in our newsfeed, with my children grown and my grandchildren growing, the words feel different. Grace has a different weight. I've seen grace. And power has a different weight. I've seen power. And weakness has a different weight. I have seen weakness. I have been weak. Rarely do we talk about this, this power that works best in weakness, power that is perfected in weakness. This is a Christ-fueled inversion, and it's one that we do not easily accept. My power, says Jesus to Paul, works best in weakness. Now, these words came to Paul in a hard time in his life. He was struggling to defend his right and his reputation as an apostle for his church that he'd planted. He'd planted this church. And he was being seen as weak, being accused as a weak and an ineffective man. And this letter of 2 Corinthians is a full-on defense for Paul, where he uses all kinds of literary tones, including, have you ever noticed sarcasm in the Bible? Like 2 Corinthians, Paul pulls on sarcasm. And he plays the part of a boasting fool. And his letter pivots right here. Because he talks about all the things he could boast about. I can tell you about all the things I've seen. I have seen so much. But then he tells us that he has this thorn in his side. It's a thing that won't go away. And this grace found the Apostle Paul while he was praying. These were the words he heard the Lord Jesus say to him when Paul was begging him to take something away. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 and 9, and God's response, do you hear it? God's response was a clear negatory. I am not taking this thing which you are asking me to remove anywhere. So many questions I have with this. So many. How did you know, Paul, that three times was enough to ask? How did you know that you should stop asking after three times? Actually, it feels a little unspiritual, don't you think, to stop after three? There are so many times in Scripture where we're told to keep on praying, to be persistent. Maybe Paul didn't have enough faith. Maybe he's not praying hard enough. Maybe he wasn't listening to his own words that he wrote to different churches about prayer. In Ephesians 6.18, he tells the people of Ephesus to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Nothing here says stop at three. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Always be joyful, never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Nothing here either that says stop at three. Even Jesus, in his teachings about prayer in Matthew 18, he uses this persistent widow as an example for how to pray. So one day Jesus told his disciples this story to show that they should always pray and never give up. 
There's a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. And a widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. And the judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, he said, I do not fear God, and I don't care about these people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. So this is what we've been taught, right? You just keep on asking. And the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. But here, here in 2 Corinthians, Paul heard his Lord and Savior say to him, Paul, my grace is enough. My power works best in weakness. And just so you don't think you're the powerful one here, Paul, because of all the things you've seen and all the things you've done, here's something to remind you that you are not that powerful. What kind of grace is this? There are so many ways to talk about grace. John Wesley was a founder of our free Methodist tradition, and he actually talks about three different kinds of grace that I have found helpful as I've, I've thought about this. The first kind of grace is kind of like, it's kind of like this residue of creation over the whole world. It's like this residue of the creator. It's like the imprint. It was a good God who created the world, and there is evidence of that grace that permeates the world in a thousand different ways, even if you do not know or believe in the creator of the world as a personal creator God. It's like the beautiful front yard of a home you walk by. It's not your house, but the beauty is a grace. It's a gift for you from God. That's the first kind of grace. The second kind of grace is like the door to this house, or maybe, maybe like the key. This is saving grace. This is a grace that makes us sons and daughters of the Almighty Lord, creator of the universe, who holds everything in his hands. We get to call him Dad. We get to be sons and daughters. It's a gift of life that's offered to all, taken by those who decide to follow. Come on in. Come on in and be with Jesus. It's that kind of grace. And then John Wesley talks about a third kind of grace. It's a perfecting grace. That is God at work in our lives as we join in on the renewal of all things and the renewal of our own lives. It's a house renovations kind of grace. A make me like Jesus kind of grace. And I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that this is one of the times in Paul's life where he was offered that kind of grace. The house renovations kind of grace. My grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. My grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Now, we actually have no idea what Paul was begging Jesus to remove. This thorn in his side, we don't know. There was a time in Paul's life when God healed him, and he'd been blind, and God, through Ananias, restored his sight, and that was a part of the story of God's grace that Paul told often. And now, Paul had something that God did not heal. God did not remove it, and Paul recognized this also as grace. It, become, it became part of his story that he wrote so that we could see. I asked three times for this to be removed, and God did not take it. Is there a thorn in your flesh that God has gently refused to heal? You have prayed and prayed, and nothing changes. You've seen the doctors. They seem unable to fix it. Maybe you experience migraines or anxiety, a lack of boundaries 
yours or somebody else's? You just can't quite tell where you should be? Maybe you've got an irritable gut. Maybe you are very impulsive in a way that you have a hard time reining in. Maybe it's an addiction that you've not disclosed to anyone. Maybe you've got a lung disease. Maybe you have limitations because of concussions. Maybe your memory is poor or failing. You've reached the intersection here of your power and the beginning of God's. This is not pretending that we've not reached the edge. This is not making up a different reality. This is not compensating. What it's doing is acknowledging the edge of our ability. Because when there is weakness, when there is insufficiency, inadequacy, when the funds do not come through, when your strength has failed, when your strategy did not account for something that was like actually mission critical, when there is a deep and a resonant no to our request, to our strategy. This is where the story pivots, right there. The story changes. This is where Jesus says, my grace is enough, right here. In this space, God's grace begins to shimmer and shine. Maybe, maybe it's not the rescue story. Not yet. This is the moment the rescue failed. Prayer was not answered. Because sometimes the grace is evident right in the moment that you need it. Sometimes the grace is illuminated through time. It emerges as we look back. And sometimes the grace is something you can see from one perspective, but not another. But Jesus says to us, my grace is enough. And Paul is being accused of weakness. Okay, says Paul to his accusers, you're right. You're right. I am weak, just like you said. I am. I've asked three times for this to be fixed. Every time God says, my grace is enough. So we do not only serve God when we successfully serve, but also through laying down our struggle for self-sufficiency when he asks us to. It's not passive. This is not saying we're being passive. We are not defeatist. We are fully active. We are aware of the edge of our agency. We are trusting that God will do what is needed. This, my friends, this is resurrection grace. Jesus also did all that was needed, and he went to the edge of agency, and he asked that this cup would be taken from him. He asked three times. The answer was no. Grace would come this way. Grace would come through the mountain. And this is a beautiful, transformative grace. Lord Jesus, we invite you through your grace to do your renovation work in our lives, in our families, in our church. We want to be with you. We want to be like you. We submit ourselves to your grace in our lives. And we boast of your power and your grace in our lives, in our weakness in our field.